It's a great um, honor to be here. Thank you for the invitation and to follow uh, Philip Lane, obviously, is a, is a privilege. And very inspiring to see uh, such a high level of interest, I think, mirrored in the interests which we see um, elsewhere in the world. And congratulations to um, Business in the Community Island uh, for holding the event um, and launching the new Business Working Responsibility Standard. We're a very large asset manager. Sometimes, um, you know, being big attracts the wrong sort of attention. Um, I'm here very much as a, 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 in a sense, as a, a representative of the asset management community, but specifically representing my institution, uh, which is large, but uh, I guess is changing also pretty rapidly. And, and I want to talk about how operating sustainably uh, is a priority for us. Why is that? Because when we think about our client needs, they're very long term. Most of our clients are endowments, pension funds and others who have very, very long term investment goals. Um, and therefore, they're interested in the long term. And we know that environmental, social and governance issues and operating sustainably uh, is very important in terms of long term value creation. What's more, maybe a number of you know about State Street Global Advisors being a large index player. That means we track the index with a lot of the assets. So in a sense, we own the good and the bad and the ugly. We can't sell those securities. So we have a very strong interest in the performance and the governance of those companies that we do hold. Uh, so as long as it's in the index, uh, we hold it. So we engage with companies that are in our portfolio um, in order that they're appropriately focused on ESG issues uh, that have these long-term material impacts uh, that will affect our clients. So the focus obviously always is on our clients' outcome from an investment perspective. So today I want to talk about four issues. Uh, one is the insights that we've gained from that process of engagement. Um, secondly, why we think it's important for businesses to integrate sustainability uh, into their long-term strategy. Um, why that integration is actually pretty challenging and what companies might do about it. Um, and finally, what we're doing as a corporation. So we're both an investor and we're a company that has our own challenge to meet our sustainability targets. So this isn't new, but certainly over the last 30 years, we've seen ESG rise in importance. Uh, we've seen great changes in the way that people live and work. And we all know the story about technology now, driverless cars, the challenge of technology to, to jobs, uh, the fact it's having an impact on our personal lives, but also our working lives. And um, from a company perspective, that affects um, global supply chains um, and the ability to nurture and grow talent in different parts of the world. So all these things are, are material and they're changing quite rapidly for companies. And without belaboring the uh, point about technology, uh, I think technology and the growth of technology is complicated the issue of sustainability and long-term planning quite significantly, and also globalization, which has, has added another layer uh, of complexity. Um, but above all, and I think um, we've had uh, mention of it already from Philip, the, the mitigation um, or adapt, ad adaptation to climate change is a particularly pressing issue. Um, and if I can just diverge there, maybe there's a kind of consensus in the room about climate change, um, but amongst investors and um, asset owners globally, I would say the consensus is not yet fully formed. And I, I think, unfortunately, it can still be a political left-right issue in some parts of the world. I think certainly less so in Europe, uh, but in some other parts of the world, it's viewed through that political lens, uh, which is unfortunate given the very strong importance of it. However, pension funds, um, asset owners, endowments and others are regarding it as more important. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago now, I was in Saudi Arabia at the Future Investment Forum and, and amongst our clients there, official institutions in Saudi Arabia, they were asking questions um, about ESG and how that might be incorporated into investment planning. So I think it's not, usual, it's not the usual suspects in Northern Europe who are, who are interested in this. I think out of about um, maybe 85 trillion of investable assets, it's now estimated that about 22 trillion globally have some sort of focus on ESG. So how can Irish businesses respond, or any business respond to the challenge and attract the capital they need and keep those, um, uh, those investment stakeholders uh, comfortable? 
Uh, so one way is to use sustainability issues to actually gr drive growth and innovation uh, as well as cut costs, um, taking advantage of new technology. And we do see a lot of examples of that when we undertake our stewardship work. So when we look at thematic areas like oil and gas, for example, which is in the hotspot um, of decarbonisation, we do see a difference between those companies that are embracing and looking for investment opportunities in renewables and taking account of the stranded assets issue um, and those that are not. But I think even within an area uh, uh, like oil and gas, uh, you see people taking the initiative and looking for the long term uh, and finding ways of investing in their business in a way that's a little bit more sustainable. Now, because we own the good, the bad, and the ugly, we're very interested in, in a sense, the left tail of the distribution, what can go wrong. And we've all seen things go wrong in our portfolio companies where people have had unsustainable business practices, either in the financial sector, in automotive sector most recently, um, and in food, undermining the long-term proposition for us as investors. Um, there's no uh, right answer. Each of them are, uh, are, are miserable, in a sense, in their own specific way. I guess what they often have in common is a lack of um, board or, or management oversight on the degree of sustainability and business practices. So things that m might look like they make sense uh, in the short term from a cash flow perspective, when you step back and say, well, are we really going to be doing that in five years, in 10 years? Is that a sustainable practice? Um, the answer is often no. So the challenge for companies may be that it's difficult to measure ESG activity and, and materiality, uh, but I think board governance and the way boards uh, view this um, is a particularly effective way of uh, dealing with it. What we want boards to focus on are these new emerging issues, and I think the Financial Stability Board uh, Task Force on uh, Climate-Related uh, Financial Disclosure, which we've signed up to, C TCFD, is a very important foundation uh, for helping that communication between investors uh, and boards and management of companies. So we, we advocate better disclosure. We know it can be confusing for companies because there's many forces asking them to disclose different things. But I think if we can get a consensus, certainly around the exposure to climate change, uh, that's very, very valuable. So on the back of the sort of engagement I've talked about, we've created a framework for boards to help capture the complexity of these issues. Um, I think in an effective way, how, what should they do? So the first thing, I think, is examine the physical risks um, arising from climate change, uh, rising sea levels, droughts, flooding, um, that can physically damage either the business or the supply chain to the business. Secondly, uh, and Philip referred to this, the regulatory risk. So as people become more serious about addressing climate change, what are the regulatory risks business face from that? Um, and how that's going to impact their business operations. And thirdly, the economic risk, um, which is encompassing any change in consumer habits, uh, sustainability of products, uh, or reputational risks if the company acts in a way that's clearly unsustainable. And again, globally, we've seen this happen many times um, with uh, predictable results. And in a way, you know, ESG is one of those frustrating things where you, you, the, there isn't a right tail of the distribution always. There's not, it's not like the companies are necessarily going to double uh, their value by, um, by behaving in a sustainable way. But the left tail uh, is pretty extreme. And I think credit investors and others are particularly attuned to the left, left tail of the distribution. So we build on that climate change framework uh, with more guidance as to how they might tackle more broad issues of sustainability. And we ask these questions typically. Does the company consider long-term sustainability trends when they're making capital allocation decisions? And again, you saw this in integrated oil and gas, differential decisions, for example, on Arctic drilling, differential decisions on investment spending on what may turn out to be stranded assets at a very high price, uh, and those that might, might be more in tune with decarbonisation. Does the board have the right skill set uh, to evaluate and monitor sustainability issues? Again, diversity is important from a gender and ethnicity perspective, but diversity of the board in being able to address those complex issues is also uh, critical. And does the board incorporate key sustainability drivers? So we shared those issues with boards, um, and we shared the criteria by which we thought asset managers would assess uh, companies. Have they identified material sustainability issues? 
Have they assessed those issues thoroughly and incorporated those implications into their long-term plan? And finally, have they communicated that approach um, to all stakeholders, um, including those who might be maybe of a short-term disposition? We all know about activists who sometimes can be accused of pressuring companies. But I think an adequate um, description of the long-term um, uh, sustainable uh, development of the company uh, is critical in addressing those issues as well. So we've seen a dramatic improvement in how people are thinking about ESG issues over the last five or ten years. And I think asset managers are also, with others, recrafting what they think of as fiduciary duty. In other words, putting their client interests first and thinking about long-term returns to encompass some of these things which are, in the short term at least, uh, not uh, so obvious um, in taking into account ESG. So ESG overall is an investment theme. Again, what, what does that actually mean and how does it relate to uh, business in the community and, um, and having an impact? If you go back 30 years, um, ESG or socially responsible investing was largely about avoiding things, avoiding things that um, perhaps were incompatible with your own values, either from a religious perspective or just an ethical perspective. And that was regardless of the returns that might be gleaned from investing in those. And I think a minority of our clients are still absolutely attuned to those particular issues. I think the second wave came where we wanted to tilt towards companies that have better attributes. And maybe a good example of this is diversity, where we've done research again, with others that has unearthed maybe an obvious point, which is if you have more gender diversity at board level and senior management level, the long run results tend to be better. So if we find companies that don't have women on the board um, now, and we could roll this, um, uh, this policy out most recently in Japan and Canada this week, um, we're, we're likely to take action because we think that will affect long term value. So tilting towards companies have better attributes. But I think the, the true reconciliation is to recognize that ESG is like any other factor that you consider as an investor um, on the future long-term cash flows and risks of the company. And so it becomes mainstream. And when we sign up to UMPRI and when we evolve our investment thinking with our active strategies as well as indexing, uh, that's exactly what we're aiming to do, to really address uh, the need to encompass ESG um, thinking and long-term thinking um, in all of what we do and recognize the asymmetric risks that companies run um, if they're not operating in a sustainable way. So that's what we do as an investor. We, we own in the index uh, the good, the bad and the ugly through governance and engagement. We try to improve standards. Where we've got an active strategy, we're now encompassing ESG as, as another tool to unearth alpha. But what do we do um, as, uh, uh, in terms of our example? So we've we signed up, as I mentioned, to UMPRI. We're not, not alone. There's over 1,000 investment managers uh, representing trillions of dollars of assets. Um, and so those principles are applied into our investment processes. Um, and at the company level, uh, we're doing more as well. So when you look at what State Street itself does with, with its own um, sustainability practices, um, I'm chairman of the um, Executive Committee on Corporate Responsibility, and so it's one of the things I do in addition to my role as, uh, as global CIO. And we're driving up the standard. So, for example, in 2012, we set ourselves a goal uh, that by 2020, we would have reduced our carbon impact um, by over 30%, uh, water usage by 20%, and diversion uh, to landfill by 90%. Now, we achieved all of those goals um, four years of head of schedule. And I say that wasn't, as they say in America, a bunny hop. It's not as if we all had coal fires in our offices. We, but we did retrofit buildings. We took a lot of action. Actually had a very positive financial payback um, and got ahead of our target. And, and we're doing more, and we've raised the bar for ourselves a little bit more. In terms of our community, the State Street Foundation, for example, um, has invested over $5 million in charities within Ireland, uh, let alone what it does globally since 2003, uh, and $400,000 this year. And our focus everywhere in the world is on education and employability. So we believe that's particularly important as a, as a lever uh, from a community perspective. And although governments can do a lot, um, when I think about what our volunteers do, they, they bring in people into the office very often, they mentor them, 
they help them with interview technique. Government can't easily do that, but people who are really enthusiastic around our, in our workforce are absolutely fantastic at it. And bridging the gap between those who are outside the workforce and look in at Canary Wharf or looking at the, um, at the financial center here and say, well, I, ca I can't imagine ever working there. Our role partly is to bridge that gap and help to, um, to make them understand actually they can do that. And I'll give you an example of one of, one of our senior managers in Ireland shared of the sort of experiences that um, the, the um, people who are beneficiaries of that program had had. And a, a lady came over uh, to thank State Street. Uh, her son had been in trouble with the police and had been referred to the Work to Loan program. He received a few months training at a local butcher which helped him to stay on the straight and narrow. And he then joined the army and is doing well. And this woman was really emotional because her son, who maybe had skirted with a, uh, you know, a much worse outcome for himself and, and family, um, had done very well thanks to the sort of support that we and many other corporations in, in Ireland are able to lend. So we're very proud of that uh, commitment. Um, staff volunteering, for example, in Ireland is over 6,000 hours uh, in 2016. Uh, and we match that and we also allow people volunteering days. I think it's really important. So our materiality as a company, what, what impact do we have on society? Well, obviously, first and foremost, we're in the financial sector, which is why I started talking about ESG and ESG investing and how we influence companies. But we're a company like any other, and we have to take in, into account the impact we have uh, and the positive impact that we can have um, in the way that we operate um, through our workforce. So we're taking a long-term view with our own corporation how we think about environmental, social, and governance issues, um, and how we can best contribute, for example, to the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals um, in meaningful ways. So we really regard this as an important issue. You could say that, uh, again, with our sort of financial hat on, it's a risk excellence issue. Um, so in order to be a reliable long-term partner um, providing financial services, we need to have a long-term view. Um, we need to have appropriate reputation and, and permission, if you like, to operate, and the way that we conduct ourselves, both as investors and as, as employers, is particularly important. So finally, we're, we're continuing to do more research in this area. We've actually uh, ramped up our spending of all the places where we're going to hire um, in 2018. Um, ESG is one of the most significant. Um, so we're building up our resources to understand how we can do a better job in ESG, and frankly, provide better products to our clients who have a strong interest in this area. So not surprisingly, if you're a board and State Street like, um, you know, will, will likely be on the shareholder register, um, then it's pretty important to understand that our perspective is that boards in the future need to consider these issues uh, very actively. They, can, they need to consider the whole raft of stakeholders um, from employees uh, to customers to suppliers and communities, just as we do at, um, at State Street. I think it's important also that although uh, you know, fair competition is very important, there are areas where companies can really get together, particularly in the same sector, um, to inform best practice and perhaps, a, in, perhaps uh, embrace uh, ESG-related risks that are common to the sector and look for ways to address those. Again, without breaching any kind of fair competition perspectives, um, because fair competition is incredibly important. We want companies to get ahead of one another. But again, sometimes you need to raise the whole standard, and, and that needs to be a kind of insider-led uh, sector-by-sector approach. So there's lots of opportunities, we think, um, to capitalize on. I think we've come a long way from um, the days where you know, ESG investing was all, all about the things you didn't own rather than the performance of companies overall improving. Um, I think many people... Um, would, would say that this is becoming more important for, on, a, on a mainstream investor agenda. I think there are, you know, there are people who obviously are, are specialists in the investment community who focus on a particular area, whether it's environmental uh, or social governance. But I guess what, what I'm um, seeking to articulate is that the evolving mainstream of investors, whether that's bankers or asset managers, are embracing ESG as just a normal muscle to flex um, in their armory of uh, ways of finding value added. 
And I think that's recognised, and I'd just close by recommending a, a recent study, not to give uh, Boston Consulting Group a, a plug, but it, Boston Consulting Group uh, just last week or the week before published a very interesting survey uh, or study, um, and it really focused on companies managing their total societal impact. Um, and they demonstrated that shareholder returns could be improved by focusing on the total impact, um, the total materiality um, impact of a company on employees, um, on the ability to build loyalty with customers, improving supply chain efficiency, um, and strengthening, particularly strengthening relationships with policymakers by having a more enlightened and long-term approach. So we're convinced that the businesses that we encounter and all of those that were investment are mindful and that they don't necessarily now see a trade-off where I can do good things for the long term, but it's going to cost me the short term. They're, they're increasingly seeing that there is one way in which the long term and short term can be reconciled. And by doing so, they will attract the sort of investment capital that they need to grow and thrive in an area, uh, or in an era, I should say, um, of disruption and stakeholder capitalism. Thank you very much for listening.